Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. We are here today with Alistair Morris who's going to be presenting on the topic of advanced CV writing for business graduates. I can see a few of you are still joining so I'll give you a few moments there but this session is the second out of our four sessions taking place throughout July for BGA Careers Month. So a few of you or many of you might have attended the first session last week with myself and Ryan um, and I'm pleased to welcome you back here today. We still do have two more sessions running throughout the month. Um, our next workshop will be taking place next week and then we'll be running the full session the following week. So you do still have time if you haven't registered for those sessions. Um, I'll put the link in the chat for that soon. But each of these sessions throughout Careers Month, so they're free for you to attend, um, one of the perks of being a BGA member. And we will be recording the sessions for those of you who are not able to make the live session today. However, we would love to see as many of you as possible join the live sessions. And I'm pleased to see so many of you have joined us today. So we're going to give away a prize pack to those members who have attended all four sessions live. Now, this prize pack is going to be one of our newest partners, the CV and Interview Advisors, which Alistair is here today joining from that organisation. And they are a provider of career enhancement and personal branding services. Now, this great partnership allows all of you as BGA members to receive a 5% discount on any of their services. Um, and all of that type of information can be found in your members area. So for one lucky member out there that's listening in today, if you attend all four sessions, we will randomly draw one of the winners and the prize pack will be to the value of £300. Um, and you can use this on any of the CV and interview advisors services. So that might be CV writing, it might be a LinkedIn makeover, it might be interview prep coaching, anything that's going to help you achieve your desired career goal. So just before we start, I would like to let you all know that we've allocated time towards the end of the webinar for your questions to get answered. So hopefully you will see a Q&A box in the Zoom panel. Um, so put your questions in there and we will hopefully be able to answer them all at the end. So without further ado, I'm really pleased to announce um, the, today's webinar and hand over to Alistair to start the session. Lovely. Thank you, Rachel. Afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for your time. As Rachel said, my name is Alistair Morris, um, and um, I'll be hosting this session for about the next uh, 45, 50 minutes or so. Um, and what I'll try and do is give you some decent insight into the world of CVs and to a lesser extent, LinkedIn. Uh, we're going to have another session on LinkedIn later this month. More about that later. Uh, just so you get a bit of confidence if it's required as to uh, what qualifies me to talk with you about the wonderful worlds of CVs. Um, I've been uh, here about 10 years or so with the CV and interview advisors, give or take. And in that time, I have reviewed something around 45,000 CVs or resumes, depending on where people are in the world and 33, 34,000 LinkedIn profiles uh, and rising, of course, by the day, literally. And before all of that, I was a recruiter. And before of that, I employed a fair few folk as well. So at the very least, what I'd rather hope to be able to do is give you some good insight in terms of what works, what doesn't, why it works, why it doesn't, and what to do to remedy the situation if you're at the... Uh, the thicker end of the recruitment process and not getting much luck. So we'll get into the detail shortly, of course. To give you some background about uh, the CV and interview advisors, or CVIA for short, um, we've helped a fair few thousand people present themselves more effectively. We're in the business of what's now called personal branding, which um, you may embrace, you may not have heard of, you may be suspicious of. Um, the reality is personal branding is probably the two best words to explain what we're about. It's how you present yourself to others, no matter the purpose. It could be about seeking an opportunity, a new opportunity. It could be internally 
building your profile for maybe a promotion or another opportunity. It may be just to present an effective message to your audience, be that suppliers, vendors, whatever. So personal branding is really important. That's what we're very good at. And so far as the CV is concerned, that's what we're focusing on for the rest of the session. Now, there are three core pillars to personal branding. Your CV or resume, LinkedIn, we'll be dealing with that later in the months, and how you perform at interview, be that virtually or physically. Those are the three core elements of personal branding. So enough about us. Um, let's get into the detail. Uh, what is a good CV may seem like an odd question, uh, but it's an important one. Well, I'll tell you what's not a good CV first, and then we'll try and address what makes a good CV. Most people write a CV that they think is good. Sadly, a lot of people are told their CV is good, strong, effective by recruiters and hiring managers, often recruiters more than hiring managers. Most hiring managers in organisations are averse to providing any commentary at all on your CV because uh, they fear all sorts of uh, retribution, um, accusations of discrimination and all sorts. So they just don't go near it. I have to tell you, amongst some of the worst people we have to write CVs for are recruiters. So they're not very good at doing the job either. They probably know what makes a good candidate, but they often won't know what makes a good CV. And that's not very helpful because it would be really nice if folk would say to you, particularly recruiters, look, your CV is a pile of rubbish. You need to do something about it. This doesn't happen a lot. It falls to people like me, sadly, and organisations like ours to do that job. Um, so most CVs are lists, name, address, academic qualifications, professional certifications, jobs in reverse chronological order with duties and responsibilities listed within each job, maybe a few hobbies and interests and such like. You might think, well, how else could it be any different from that? It can be a lot different from that. And that type of CV isn't very strong. It doesn't enhance most people's personal brand. And if you're suspicious about that, just think about it. If you're presenting just a list of stuff to people in the fashion I've just described, and you line up 100 applicants, and that's a modest number these days, for an opportunity, and let's assume that all 100 applicants are relatively well qualified to perform the role. That is a dangerous assumption, by the way. There's a good chunk of applicants who aren't qualified to perform the role, but that doesn't stop them applying for the job. But let's just assume for today's purposes of perfection that 100 people apply for a job, you're one of the 100, you've sent a list-based CV, which statistically is what most people on this session will be doing. How does that look to a recruiter or hiring manager? And if you've ever recruited anybody, you'll probably know the answer to this. Everyone looks the same other than their name and address. They're not reasons to interview people. CV's job is to get you the interview, not the job, interestingly. And you're not going to get an interview if you look like everyone else, because there's a really strong chance you'll get rejected. And the people who are selected for the long list, roughly 10 people, and the short list, roughly three to five people, they're the ones that are going to get forward and they're the ones who've probably done something slightly different. So you're a recruiter, you're a hiring manager, you've received 100 CVs, most of them look identical. In other words, other than name and address, people have got the same academic qualifications, give or take. They've got the same professional accreditations, give or take. They've worked in similar businesses, give or take. They have similar duties and responsibilities because they're performing similar roles because they're all aligned to the role that they're targeting. They've all done similar things, which equips them with the skills and competence to do the next role, the one that they've applied for. How does the recruiter or hiring manager decide which of the 10 best in speech marks people to put on the long list, let alone the three to five that deserve an interview? from which hopefully one will be made a job offer. How do they make that decision? The answer is they can't. It becomes a lottery. They cannot decide purely from the CV who's good and who isn't. And that's the problem with most people's CVs. So our view, remember this is evidenced by a good few years of experience. We've been around as a business for knocking on 16 years or so now. A good CV is one that presents a really strong business case as to why someone should be hiring you. 
initially interviewing you, but the argument should be, of course, what are you going to bring to the party? The rest of this session is going to be about how you build that business case. It should reinforce your personal brand and justify why you're worth including on the long list. So good CV is a business case. Bad CV is just a list of stuff. And I think most people realize these days that a CV needs to work with the machines as well as the human beings. Now, we'll be touching on this throughout the session, but also towards the end, uh, there's quite a lot of stuff you need to know about how these modern applicant tracking systems and their algorithms work, because they are the nail in the coffin for a lot of people, sadly. This little comment at the bottom of the screen in the white box, very simple, but really important. I, I referenced this very early on on this slide. Recruiters and hiring managers can only really make decisions on who to shortlist based on the contents of your CV and probably your LinkedIn profile. There is no magic fairy dust they can sprinkle into the atmosphere that will reveal those 10 best people out of the 100 that applied for the job that you also applied for. There's no crystal ball they can gaze into, which will give them some magical insight that you truly are one of the 10 that deserves being on the long list. They can only make those decisions unless they know you already. And in which case that could be happy days, but most people don't know you. Can only make their decision based on what you have sent them via your CV and maybe what's on your LinkedIn profile. And that's it. Present them good information, a business case, you'll be more successful. It really is as simple as that. And if you're in any doubt at any stage of your career about your, your CV and its quality, it is simply down to its success at getting you access to the opportunities you're interested in. Good, strong, relevant opportunities. That's happening more often than not. Keep doing whatever you're doing. If it isn't, fix the CV, your message. A uh, bit of a negative spin before we get into the positive stuff. The following points are key mistakes that people have been making for as long as I can remember. They're currently making them right now. I've already seen five CVs this morning or today that were guilty of something on this list. And I suspect, sadly, they're going to be mistakes people will continue to make for as far forward as I can see. So they are relevant, but they're in no particular order. Linked to this concept of personal branding is people having a rather ambiguous, what we call go-to-market description. It's incredibly difficult when you're looking at CV sometimes to figure out where on earth the person's heading. I think most people write a CV that is historically accurate. And that's the problem. Recruiters and hiring managers normally focus on an opportunity for which they've yet to appoint anybody, which is all about the future and future potential. And an individual CV tends to be a remarkably accurate record of what's happened so far. The two are remarkably different. One is like looking in your rearview mirror if you're sat in a car, your CV. The other, the opportunity you're interested in, is gazing through the windscreen two completely different viewpoints. There has to be a balance, of course. Building a strong business case on a CV is all about, yes, of course, recording, presenting what's happened, but with a mindset of what that will mean going forwards. What potential have you got? Linked to that, uh, we'll be talking about this in a little bit more detail shortly. A value proposition, basically your professional reason for existence. If that doesn't exist, if you're just assuming because you've had certain titles or you've gone to certain academic establishments that equips you with the skills someone's looking for, that's a dangerous assumption to make. Again, it's what most people do that doesn't make it right. You need to clearly explain to your audience what you are and where you're heading. More on that shortly. Most people have an introductory piece of text on their CV. Chances are you'll be calling it a personal profile, personal summary, personal statement, career objective sometimes, career synopsis I've seen. It does actually matter what you call those, but that's for later. By the way, the headings of these sections now matters. But it's the text that's the real important part. 
if you've got references to enthusiasm, dedication, commitment, passion, drive, the ability to work in a team or as an individual or any of that stuff, I'm afraid you're already heading in the wrong direction. Recruiters and hiring managers at the critical filtering stage of a recruitment process, if you like, the, the thick end of the process rather than the thin end, where there's lots of people like you interested in the same opportunity. They are not remotely interested in your levels of enthusiasm, dedication, passion, drive or whatever. What they're really interested in are your technical and functional skills, the black and white stuff, which is either there or not and can be evidenced on your CV. You try and prove how enthusiastic you are on a CV and you deserve a mystery prize. It's almost impossible. Also, like, no one's interested in it. And I can hear a few people shouting at the screen saying, yeah, but the adverts ask for enthusiastic, driven, dynamic people. So that's what I put on my CV because that's what I've been told to do or what I understood you should do. Time and a place. Time and a place. Recruiters and hiring managers, when they meet you physically or virtually, that is the earliest point at which they can judge you on these softer skills, the earliest point. The reality is you need to be working somewhere for a month or two before anyone's really comfortable with your levels of enthusiasm, reliability, punctuality, etc. So the CV is pointless in trying to articulate these. No one's interested in them. The earliest point is when you get an interview. You won't get an interview if your CV has not done the job. The CV needs to focus on technical and functional skills. I said, we're going to touch on this a bit later. It's a message to be repeated, and it will be repeated more than once. If you've not sat down and re-engineered your CV for today's modern recruitment software, these applicant tracking systems, and indeed, as we'll see on the LinkedIn session later in the month, written your LinkedIn profile with how recruiters search and use LinkedIn, which is all filters and algorithms and such like, again, you're at a disadvantage. So much has changed in the last few years. I'm afraid most people, particularly in the UK, are quite modest. They think, well, it's not the time and the place to tell people what I'm capable of. I'm afraid it is. A CV is part of the decision making process as to whether you get any further forward to the sharper end of the recruitment process. You've got to be prepared to tell people what you're capable of. So you need achievements. You need a lot of achievements on a CV. Increasingly, we're living in a world of social proofing. You'll check out product brands or services online uh, before you engage with them. It's the same with recruitment. If you've on LinkedIn got recommendations, that's healthy, seen as a good thing. Uh, we'd recommend doing that on CVs as well. Talk more about that later. Obvious things which have been a problem since the dawn of time still are issues. Sadly, well over half the CVs I see and nearer three quarters of the CVs that recruiters and hiring managers get on average have grammatical typo spelling errors. Still, <coughs> given all the automation and corrective abilities of modern software, it's a real surprise, but it still, it still happens. Ditto if you flung your CV together because you really couldn't be bothered, uh, you don't like doing it, which is understandable. That is a personal branding issue. It will look like you can't be bothered. And the reader, particularly the human readers, of course, will pick up on that vibe and mark you down as a consequence. Link to that if you've got weak content, if, if particularly in your experience section, if each job that you've done looks quite different in terms of how you've laid it out, the balance of content, the structure of that content, it sends messages. The language you use, as we'll shortly see, matters a lot, um, but avoid being overly creative with colours or graphics or infographics or whatever you want to call them. I'm afraid the machines, the automated systems, aren't ready for overly creative CVs. So if you think it's a wise idea, a clever idea, a nice idea to create some heavily graphic a CV with slider bars or star charts or bullet radio button kind of assessments of your skills. For example, Microsoft Excel, you think you're very good at it. You've got 10 blobs. You give yourself eight out of 10 blobs. No system can read that yet. More to the point, a human being picking up that will think, well, you judge yourself to be eight out of 10. 
but I'm not so sure about that. I'm not convinced about that. You know, we'll make up our own mind. So self-assessment of skills is a very dodgy thing to be up to anyway. And interpreting that graphically is a nightmare because none of the systems can make head and tail of that. And if you're putting eight out of 10 and someone's put four out of five, how does the machine make head and tail of that? They can't. So lots of things people are getting wrong. Let's focus a little bit more on the positive stuff. What should you be doing? What indeed does a good CV look like? One that builds a strong business case. So on the right hand side of this slide is a chap called Matt Craven. Now, he just happens to be the guy that runs this business. And the content you can see on this slide is real. Not that that really matters. And it's the first page of Matt's CV. And really, that's the important page. Uh, a lot of people get hung up about the number of pages a CV should have. And the sweet spot's going to be somewhere between two and four pages, depending on how much you've lived in your professional career and who you're targeting. Um, but there isn't a big deal about whether it's two, three or four pages. What's really important, though, is beyond any question, is the importance of page one. That's where the business case gets built. And what you can see on screen is what we call our chronological CV. Uh, slightly tongue in cheek saying on steroids, because there's some things we're doing here that most people don't do, but we know make a difference. Now, everything you see today, so far as content, structure, layout, is what we typically do for our clients right now. We've probably been doing it in this particular style for a couple of years now. Things change and evolve over time. But the most important thing is whether you like it or not, what you see works. It's proven. It's beyond question. So this is not theoretical nonsense. It's not stuff I dreamt up earlier today or last week thinking, well, this will do for uh, Monday. This is stuff we do. We put into the marketplace. Clients pay us money to do and we get the results. We know whether it works or not. And we'd change it if it wasn't working. So whether you like this or not, to be honest, really ought to be the least of your worries. It's about whether it works. And, and that bit, I can assure you, it does. So this style of CV, this chronological CV, is pretty much the safe default option for anybody. It doesn't matter how many years experience you've got or not, with one exception. If you're going for entry level roles, your first proper job, so to speak, there's something different I'll show you later. But for anybody with any experience at all, at any level, in any role, this is where you probably need to be structurally and content wise. However, the devil is very much in the detail. You cannot just fling words at a document and call it job done. There are some things going on here, simple though it may seem, that go behind building that business case that I referred to and I'll keep banging on about. That introductory profile summary statement needs to be tweaked in fact, the first three sections of this CV, which are really important, all need to be tailored depending on the role that you're interested in. So we would encourage you, if you were going about writing a CV, to spend a lot of time and attention on this introductory statement. It is really important. Now, I'll show you a bit more about this shortly. We'll get into the detail because it is so important. But you need to be prepared to tweak bits of this depending on the role you're applying for. Those key skills, you'll notice the bullet pointed key skills, they're all fairly snappy and short, two, three, four words, something like that. It's not everything that Matt can do because that would produce a document of some length in its own right, as it would for, for you. It's a snapshot. It's really the most relevant skills that you could possibly hurl in the direction of the audience that you're targeting at that moment in time. And they need to really replicate and mirror the terminology that the organization you're targeting is using. Again, that section is reordered or repopulated depending on the role. And then finally, as far as these three sections are concerned, um, career highlights, three paragraphs, case studies, if you like, as to why Matt would make a good, well, he seems to be wanting to target commercial director roles, so we're imagining those three career highlights. They should be really great examples of how he could be a good commercial director. Three is the magic number. It controls the length of the rest of the document. It allows Matt's career history to start on page one, but at the bottom, probably a lot lower than many of you will currently have. 
And if you're wondering about that, by the way, that is because if you open up with your career history too quickly, you will be judged by that. Now, in Matt's case, this is really important. It might be for you. He is targeting quite deliberately a commercial director role. In a lot of people's world, commercial director is one below managing director. So if Matt was to open up his CV too quickly with, look at me, look at me, I'm a managing director, a lot of his audience will think, wow, we don't want one of them. Our business, our client has already got a managing director. We want a commercial director. Reject. And they won't read anymore. They've just made that decision. A machine may have made that decision. It's a tough old world. Got to think about what the audience is imagining. And if Matt's going for a commercial director role, they're probably not imagining their best, sorry, not imagining their best candidate to come from the world of MD already. They'll be thinking something else. So Matt's got a bit of a job in his hand and he's trying to engineer things to his advantage through those three sections that we'll get into the detail of very shortly. <coughs> now, although I say tailor a CV uh, for each role, which you should be doing, I think most people probably know that in fairness, a lot of folk we know say, well, that's a right pain in the backside, uh, can't be bothered, or are you serious? Unfortunately, yeah, it is serious. You have to be prepared to do it. That doesn't mean to say that this takes hours, days or weeks. If the content's already prepared, if you put the effort in, this is literally seconds or minutes. You just basically place the right content in the right place and send off the CV. So it does require a bit of upfront work, but once that's done, this tailoring, this customization's a real breeze. Now, before we get into the detail, let me just show you, for anybody interested in a much uh, earlier level of career, possibly entry level or first proper job after some part time or voluntary or internship or anything like that is a slightly different version of the CV that still builds a strong business case, but is deliberately targeting entry level early career kind of folk. So this is only suitable for people with very limited work experience. But it is also suitable for people with no work experience, possibly undergraduates. You can see there's still an opening profile summary statement, introductory text. We'll get on to that shortly. Education takes much more of a feature because that's still important. And rather than career highlights, because you can't really have career highlights if you've not had a career or much of a career. We've taken the key skills and broadened them, enhanced them. We've identified in this particular case with Joe Bloggs five key skills that his audience seems to be interested in, financial management, operational management, entrepreneurialism, et cetera, et cetera. Then we've used a process that was used to build those career highlights you saw on Matt's CV into case studies that demonstrate how Joe, Joe Bloggs, can deliver against those five identified key skills. Now I'll get into this, the detail of how we write those career highlights or case studies very shortly. The principle here is still the same. You identify what the audience is looking for as best you can, and then you evidence through your experience from wherever it may come. That could be in Joe's case, internships, university projects, part-time work. And that builds the business case as to why someone should be interested in Joe. Finally, at the other end of the scale, anybody looking to do quite a senior type of role, um, this is a particularly applies to people interested in non-exec direct roles um, or where the audience has given a strong clue that they're not interested in a full-blown CV, they want a snapshot of you, possibly if you're networking and you wanna give people just that snapshot. You don't know if they've got an opportunity, but it's an opportunity to give them your details without a full-blown CV. What you see on the left-hand side is Matt now um, positioning himself for that kind of audience. On one page, just giving a snapshot of what he's capable of. He's still got an introductory statement. His career history is abbreviated to a narrative and some one-liners on where he's been and what he's been up to. There's still that evidence through career highlights. And then there's a bit of supplementary information. 
it's a bit of a niche product this it won't be for everybody but it's a useful tool if you're putting a shot across someone's bows or you're speculatively looking at opportunities within all target organizations normally at a relatively senior level so common to all of those documents were three really important areas which i said i'd come back to and explain in more detail there's that profile summary statement at the top that the key skills bullet pointed for people with experience or fleshed out for the undergraduates or early entry level folk and then the career highlights or case studies as the evidence to support why someone should be interested in the individual so let's start with the introductory text first there's an example in the white box that you can see on the screen and it breaks down into a number of sections so what i'm hopefully will well, hope will come across from this is that as I said earlier, we're not just flinging words at the document. There's a structure and a flow to page one of the CV, which is super critical. And it starts with this introductory text. So this is at the top of the CV. Um, a lot of people have it, as I said, but a lot of people you'll find will go into their personal skills, their soft behavioral skills, and they'll be way too vague. They'll often say something like, uh, I'm a, uh, an enthusiastic IT professional or a determined HR professional or something like that. Often it's that insert sector professional, something like that, way too vague. You find me a job where the title and the expectation is that the recruiter and hiring manager have actually specified they're looking for an IT professional, an HR professional, a logistics professional. They don't exist. Those titles don't exist. No one's searching for that. If you look at a recruiter or a hiring manager, they'll never enter the words IT professional because they get buried in responses. In this case, we're imagining they're probably looking for a commercial director. I'll show you another example in a minute. Very precise. So you insert the title that you're going for here or as close as you can get to it. Then the rest of the text starts to build a case already as to why this individual would make a strong commercial director. In other words, you're getting across, hopefully in the first sentence, let alone the paragraph, that you are a valid, credible candidate. No question. Whereas if you are a recruiter or hiring manager and you've seen out of those 100 mythical applicants, you know, 90 or so people saying, I'm a really enthusiastic, driven, dedicated IT professional who can work well in the team as an individual. Um, and I, you know, I'm really passionate about blah, 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 blah. If you've seen that 90 odd times, that becomes a reason to reject, not include. And you'll pick up on the literally the small number, the handful of people who've done something differently like this person. And you'll go, hallelujah. This person's actually given me a reason almost to live let alone select, because you get fed up of it. You get absolutely fed up of it. You think, here we go again. Please, where are the people who are what I'm looking for? So that first sentence achieves two things. There's a clear description of what you are. We call this a cheap red shoes theory. Keep, I'll come back to that very shortly. Secondly, what is your professional reason for existence? That first sentence should address that. Now I know, because I've seen it, I've done it myself, and I know others have done it. That first sentence can be enough sometimes to get you into the yes or the maybe pile without anybody reading anything more. Because if you've already rejected a large number of candidates or the machines rejected a large number of candidates, and you stumble across someone who's actually presented a message which is relevant to your needs, meets your expectations, as I said, it can be a hallelujah. You just think, think, Ah, relief. Finally, someone in the space we're expecting them to be straight into the maybe pile or the yes pile. It can be that dramatic. Now, the cheap red shoes theory is a little tongue in cheek, tangential view on this. Yeah, if after this webinar you needed to buy some cheap red shoes and you'd not done it before, you'd head off to the Internet. You'd enter cheap red shoes. You get a wall of results. You might put in your location. You'll get slightly less results. The 
the point here is that if cheapredshoes.co.uk existed and popped up on page one, you'd click on it. It's exactly what you're after. Whereas you'd swerve all those other generic things like cheapredanything.co.uk or cheapallsortsofthings.com. It's not what you're after. It's not specific enough. Just the same in the recruitment world. So if someone's looking for commercial director and they land on this text which says or implies that the person is a commercial director, because they may not be. Remember Matt? Matt's a managing director right now, but he's positioning himself as a commercial director. And that's quite important. This text would likely land whoever the person owning it is into the yes or maybe part, either through the automated systems or the human eye. The set, I dwell on this because it's so important. We'll get through the rest a little bit quicker. The key strengths include, second sentence starts key strengths include, and then you list a handful of things you're good at that are relevant to the audience you're targeting. And the red text for the benefit of this webinar only is using a sales technique, which some of you may have heard of, features and benefits, FAB, features and benefits. Lots of salespeople have taught this. We've brought it into the world of CV writing. You link a feature, because lots of people can say, hey, look, I've got this, to a benefit, answering the question, so what? So you can see here the individual saying, that they can carve niche, develop first to market products, assemble, manage high performing teams, embedding a culture of excellence. You could say, well, so what? The answer in text, in red text, sorry, the benefit to facilitate superior service delivery capability and commercial performance. Now written properly, you're also gonna tweak a few of the algorithms there because those are words, technical and functional things that people are interested in, looking for, might pop up when those algorithms run. So it's a paragraph, but it's not just any old paragraph. There's been a lot of effort applied to this to get across the message that you're specifically a valid, credible candidate, that you've got something to offer the world, that you're good at some things that ideally the audience is looking for. Here's another example. This time a management accountant. Not an accounting professional, not a finance professional, but a SEMA and MBA qualified management accountant. Now, we typically get the headline news of professional or academic achievements in this text because they're often black and white things. With accountants, you need to be normally part or fully qualified, and it's ACCA, AAT, or SEMA or something like that. It might be a stipulation of the role and the application process that you have a certain degree or an MBA or something like that. If that were case, or if you believed it to be powerful, you'd get those references in there, just like this individual has. Same principles apply. Very clear what this person is, management accountant, and the red text reinforces benefits that they could bring to the party rather than just listing the features that lots of their competitors will also be doing. Then the key skills. So that's number one of the three things, profile summary. Key skills number two. This is all about the machines, hence the reference to Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator movies. Uh, search engine optimization. So their reference to SEO, just for the avoidance of doubt. Search engine optimization of your CV, dramatically enhanced if you get the right content into the CV. I think most people realize that. What most people don't realize from the evidence I see and others see is that they focus on the wrong skills, the soft personal behavioral ones, or at least they sprinkle a good measure of those as well as the technical and functional ones. And I promise you, the CV is not a place for the soft personal skills. That will come later when you get the interview. So for now, focus purely on technical and functional skills. There are a selection on the screen, two, three, four words, no more than that. Not everything you can do tailored to the role you're applying for. Ideally, also using the terminology the organization might be using if you can identify it. Then the third of the three areas are those career highlights or case studies, as I referred to them as well. There's an example in the white box. Um, we'll take a look at that in a minute. Everyone likes a good story. Um, it's the same in the world of recruitment. 
as long as those stories are fact, not fiction, of course. Um, this is quite a novel thing. We, we don't see many people doing this. We've been doing it for years. It works really well. It's more about the human eye, this one. This is more about hiring managers wanting to find out who they should be interviewing. So maybe they've got the long list, 10 people. The recruiter or their partner has given them, their HR department or whatever, has given them that information. They're looking at the 10 in a bit more detail. They may still really just focus on page one before making a decision. And really, you want to give them a face full of really good, positive, compelling information about how you could fit in, what you could bring to the party, what you could deliver. So again, um, really important how these case studies are written. Uh, I'm conscious that some people will have heard from their Aunt Maud or someone on the internet or some other dodgy source that you need to be brief. Brevity is key. There's no place on a CV for text like the stuff you can see on screen right now. And that surely in the 2.9 seconds that you've got, because again, you've read that on the internet, um, that someone can possibly read your CV with all this text. And there's a fundamental urban myth there as well. Yes, you have a limited amount of time. Either the machines are doing something in nanoseconds, but to be honest, the machines couldn't care less where you submitted them a document, 100 pages, finely dense text with no spacing, no formatting. If you fed that into an applicant tracking system, it would love it. It would absolutely love it. But of course, when it lands on the recruiter or hiring manager's desk, they'd reject you because they couldn't make sense of what had been sent. So you've got two different audiences. But the reality is you have a short amount of time with a human being. Absolutely true. But that, that time varies. You can't possibly get that right all the time. I can't possibly tell you it's X number of seconds. It's a small amount of time. But it's not about reading the whole document in that amount of time. It's not even about reading the whole of page one in whatever amount of time you're getting. It's about what on that page, particularly page one or within your CV, is going to trigger the next step. That's the difference. So it could be, as I said earlier, they read the first sentence of your profile summary statement and you're through. Or it could be they land on one of these career highlights and you're through. Who knows? We just know that it's going to be something about page one. I promise you what we do works. So whatever you might think about having a chunk of text repeated as it happens to be three times on a CV, three separate case studies, these produce results. Now the tool being used here or the mythology being used here to build up this text is STAR, situation, task, actions, result. One example on the screen in the white box, it's a real example, ERAC stands for Enterprise Rent-A-Car, it's off Matt's CV, he really was there uh, doing what you can read on the screen. The first sentence, always the situation, what was going on, S of star. Second sentence, always the task, what was the responsibility resting on his shoulders at that moment in time, sales and ops manager. Bulk of the remaining text, the actions, what did he do? Final sentence, result, what happened? Not too much information to bore people rigid, not too little information to leave people wondering what on earth went on. Is this good, bad or indifferent? What a lot of folk will do was almost use the final sentence of this text on their CV. So, for example, Matt might say if he wasn't good at writing CVs, he might say I was at Enterprise rent -a car doing this kind of job and achievements, bullet points, succeeded in rebranding the business and turning a loss into a profit within six months. And he'll know that that's great. And he'll think that that's impressive. Because he lived it. But the reader's thinking, I just don't get it. What, what happened? How? Where? Why? What? When? In fact, it leads to more questions and often results in having no impact whatsoever. So you have to have a bit of meat on the bone with these career highlights. The other thing about these career highlights is that they're all on page one, out with the chronological order of Matt's career. Matt was at Enterprise Rent-A-Car in the late 90s 
Yet on page one of his CV, well before he gets anywhere near to that part of his CV as to his chronological order, he's got right in the middle, a career highlight, over 20 years old, but it demonstrates why he'd make a strong commercial director because he did something very commercially strong. No one needs to know in the case study how old it is. That's why it doesn't say in 1996, I was at Enterprise Rent-A-Car. It just says, I've done something, it's relevant, here's a bit of information, I think you'll like it. And people do. When you get to your career history, and now we're, what, three quarters of the way through the session, perhaps a little bit longer, further rather, and we're now talking about career history. I said earlier, you don't want this too high up page one. You need it on page one, but not at the top, not in the middle. These are the sections you need to consider having, not that you have to have them all the time. And in fact, you don't need to detail every role you've ever done. You need to focus on the more recent history. We say roughly the last eight to 10 years, if you've got that much under your belt. If you've got less than that, everything goes on the CV. If you've got more than that, you, you have a decision to make. You don't necessarily have to list everything in the same amount of detail. Readers won't be interested in the early stuff. So it does need to be reverse chronological order. You do need to start on page one. Always provide a brief, maybe just a sentence, as to who you're working for or with. What was your role about? If there was a team, how did you fit in? What are you measured on? Most people don't go anywhere near that. A few duties and responsibilities, but not your job description balanced with and exceeded by the number of key projects and achievements within each role. Notwithstanding those three career highlights on page one, still within the body of your career history, you explain other things that you did which were relevant and important. A brief interlude, um, just because at this point, often we get asked, I can't see the questions on this platform right now, but often people start asking, ah, oh, I now know that I need help. My personal branding is not where it should be. Can you guys help? So briefly, if at any stage now or in the not too distant, you think you need help with how you're presenting yourself to prospective employers, obviously that's our day job. That's what we do. And we're pretty good at it. This is how that service works. We match you up with someone familiar with your space. And we take a bit of time about that. And we've got a really good team of people who know what they're doing. So you'll get someone appropriate. They'll spend whatever time it takes, but typically a couple of hours extracting all the raw data we need from you. Then they'll go away and rewrite your CV and or LinkedIn profile. Normally it's both, but it doesn't have to be. Typically that process takes anywhere between five to 10 working days. Normally you need a bit of time to prep. We'll book you in with one of the team and then they'll take three to five working days to turn around the work. We can go faster sometimes or we can go much slower if you want to defer the service itself. That's up to you. But that facility exists should you decide to use it. And um, as Rachel suggested, as well as the discount you get sort of year round, as it were, for the purposes of this webinar, we do always offer some really special deals right at the end, and I'll, I'll, and I'll do that before I wrap up. Now, I said just you focus on the last eight to 10 years, roughly, of your career. And if you've got more than that, you don't necessarily, necessarily need to list everything. So with anybody with, uh, let's say, 15, 20 years of experience, if that applied, you don't necessarily need to detail that earlier experience. It's a decision we make with each individual we work with, but broadly we say focus on the last eight to 10 years or four jobs. There's always differences for each individual, but anything earlier than that, if you're gonna mention it at all, you can just one line it from this date to that date. Here was the employer, here's the organization. That's it, end of. You might not need to mention it at all, particularly if you fear age discrimination. That's one way of keeping the CV to a modest length as well. A few other points um, that are sort of obvious, but not so obvious. 
if you were to look at a re-recording of this webinar and focus on Matt's CV and some of the text that I've been showing, particularly of those three sections that really matter, you'll have noticed that um, there's a lot of attention going into the writing style. It is what we call a very tight writing style. We don't use words where they're not appropriate, relevant or superfluous. So it's not just the technical nature of the CV that's going on, the structure and the flow. It's also the content. Spend a lot of time on that, thinking about the content and how people use CVs. Um, just to give a bit of a spin off on that, um, people aren't interested with all due respect to your life story. Although that might be quite impactful and it, it might explain why you're at the point you're at. Most folk just they're not interested in that during this very initial part of the recruitment process it might be important to you it might mean something but i'd be very wary about explaining life stories personal stories on a cv time and a place again i said we lived in a world of social proofing uh, we encourage people to bring recommendations that they may have from linkedin onto their cv that's very important just one or two examples um, Recommendations should come from people who've managed, hired or engaged your services before, not from this fictitious Aunt Maud that I've referred to before. And just because your aunt likes you and thinks you deserve a job, um, that's not really going to go down well with your target audience. You need good, meaty recommendations from meaningful people. If you don't have them, it doesn't matter. Make it your business to get them next time. I said we'd come back to applicant tracking systems, and I subtly referred to a few of these things earlier. Uh, these issues are really important. Fundamentally, if you've not re-engineered your CV to meet the requirements of modern applicant tracking systems and their wonderful algorithms, you will be at a disadvantage. That's just fact. So here are the, and then by the way, there is no silver bullet to this. There's nothing you can do to guarantee you're always going to get through these systems, but there are some things you can do to enhance your chances. So interestingly, putting the job title you're going for at the top of your CV after your name is like one whacking great big digital signpost. So you should try and do it. Matt did it, commercial director. He's never been a commercial director, but he could be. He has the skills, knowledge, and experience to perform the role. That's what goes at the top of his CV. It also was the within the first sentence of his profile summary statement, if you remember. Experienced commercial director, not seasoned managing director, which is what he actually is. He's positioning himself for the future audience. Remember, looking through the windscreen versus rearview mirror. Phrases like expert in, followed by whatever you are an expert in, are important. The systems will sometimes look out for that. They'll say, OK, we want to know what this person is an expert in. So you can lead them to that information by sticking the words expert in and then explaining what their expertise is. Most people know key skills, key words, key phrases need to be embedded within the CV, but they need to be technical and functional, not in uh, not soft personal behavior. Ideally, match that content with the content in a person spec, job spec, job description website, whatever. Don't just leave it the same every time you send the CV off. I said this earlier subtly, the headings of your CV sections now matter. They are digital signposts. Profile slash summary for that introductory text tends to be the best combination right now. These things change and evolve over time. Personal profile, personal statement, personal whatever tend not to be so good mainly because that word personal leads people then to go rabbiting on about how enthusiastic warm and cuddly they are and i promise you no one's interested but what people might very well be interested in is where you're based and you need to be careful about this so if you're applying for an opportunity that is down your road or close by great Systems can do the maths, by the way, now. They can work out where you are, where the opportunity is, and make decisions. Whether they make the right decisions is another point, but they make decisions. So if you're conscious that you're going from area A to area Z, and the two are separated by hundreds of miles, you need to be prepared to explain that somewhere.
We're going to be talking about LinkedIn later this month. In fact, I think, yes, it's the July 23rd. Um, and um, you might have seen details about this already and already have been registered for it. If not, make sure you join us for that webinar unless you uh, didn't enjoy this session. <laughs> it's not going to get radically different other than we're going to be talking about LinkedIn rather than CVs. Uh, briefly, though, you need to treat C uh, LinkedIn seriously. It's as important as your CV now is. We used to say a few years ago, doesn't really matter. Optional extra now really important. Uh, it's massive. It dwarfs all the job boards uh, out there singularly and quite a few of them added together. It's become a job board. It's becoming a job board by the day. Uh, but if your LinkedIn profile is just a copy and paste job of your CV, even if it were a great CV, that's not good, by the way. We don't do that. We don't copy our CVs into LinkedIn. A wholly different approach, as you'll find out about later in the month. Um, but it's really important because if you apply for a job with a CV and get to the sharp end of the process, people will check you out on LinkedIn and they need to feel comfortable. They don't want to see inconsistencies or some other problem. If you apply with a job using LinkedIn or network or try to connect with people, it just brings them to your profile. If you've got something there that doesn't align with their expectations, it can be game over. Really, really important. More on that later in the month. And to wrap up, um, I promise special offers. These are time limited webinar special offers on our services they're much deeper discounts than the year-round discount you'd get um, normally and they're available at the url that you can see top right of the screen so it's our domain followed by forward slash bga1207 and there you will find these three offers Basic offer, left-hand side of the screen, we'll write your CV and LinkedIn profile with three star-based case studies. That will align you well for a type of role that you're going for, broadly a particular type of role. That'd be absolutely fine for that. Uh, ordinarily 398 plus VAT, but you get it for 299 plus VAT. In the middle of the three, we'll write your CV and LinkedIn profile, but give you four extra case studies. So you get seven instead of three. That's great for people who are targeting multiple roles or have got quite a lot of experience under their belt and need to be able to position their CV to different audiences. And then finally, on the right hand side, all of what I just said, plus a one page exec bio, that's probably only for those that are targeting quite senior types of role. And as I said earlier, we get in touch with you, book you with one of our team. They'll then look after you and deliver everything that you're interested in. That concludes the session. Uh, I know there was a lot of stuff thrown in your general direction. Um, I hope it struck a chord. Um, I'm going to hand back to Rachel now. And Rachel, I believe there might have been some questions. Uh, how do you want to play that? That's correct. Thank you, Alistair, for that really insightful session about all about structure of your CV. So we do have possibly a few minutes to answer some of your questions. Um, so I'll just fire your way now, if that's OK, Alistair. Sure. Great. So the first one, which I think is on quite a lot of the members' minds, is seen as our members are located all around the world. Um, of course, they have CVs that's going to be needed to be structured in the appropriate way of where they're applying for jobs. So the question was around um, in terms of if they took up any of your services or what you're showing today as the structure. Is that applicable for anyone globally? Um, and do you offer services based on the country that they're going to be applying for those roles in? Yes, in, and, and in the main, everything that you've seen today applies globally. In the US and Canada, but particularly the US, there are slight differences. Obviously, they call it a resume rather than a CV. Um, and um, if you're in the US, uh, the paper that we you would print that C, uh, resume on would be not an A4 piece of paper like in the UK and Europe. It would be a US letter. Uh, so there's slightly different formatting issues that go on in the US. In some countries, you have photos of the individual um, and in others, you definitely wouldn't. Um, but the broad structure of what you've seen 
with a few tweaks here and there is uh, is the same the world over. But we apply those geographical changes depending on where the individual's based. Yeah. The only only thing I should say is that at the moment we can only write CVs in the English language, be that US uh, or UK or wherever. It's it's English language. Other than that, everything that you've seen works. Uh, the other benefit for anybody outside the UK is that our VAT does not apply. So the prices you see on the screen and the prices you pay converted into your local currency, you don't pay UK VAT. Perfect, thanks Alistair. And so in terms of our members who have been unemployed for a certain time, or perhaps they're studying and therefore not currently employed, how would they include that period in their CV to, um, you know, demonstrate that they're either been unemployed or they're currently in full-time education? Yes, that's a really good question and happens to a lot of people, of course, or affects a lot of people. The most important element of what I've been through today sort of deals with this, which is that page one of the CV is much more of a focus on your abilities, capabilities, potential than explaining to people what's currently happening. Now, by that, I mean the information that hits the reader in the face is all about your potential based on your experience if you've any experience or your potential if you're studying and don't have much experience that profile summary the key skills the three career highlights they're all about things that you've got to offer and it's only right at the bottom of page one that you start need to considering how you present your career history and if you're currently unemployed but have experienced previously of course, that's where the focus needs to be. It's that experience that you already have that someone should be interested in. Of course, when you get to your career history, you're going to have to explain any substantial gaps. If you've been in unemployed for a week or two, don't need to mention it. But if you've been unemployed or studying for several months, you're probably just going to need a brief reference to that. Um, and then it's always different on the individual because some people will have been unemployed because of the pandemic. And I think most people are uh, understanding of that. Um, some people will be studying. And so that's a very good reason to explain why you're not currently working because you're bettering yourself and improving yourself. And of course, that's a large part of your uh, potential and offering and positioning. So it all depends on the individual and their circumstances. But the, the most important element is to make sure page one focuses on your abilities and potential, not just shouting to people, Basically, I'm, I'm unemployed because that leaps off quite a lot of people's CVs. And that's that's not a great message because you need the context, the substance, the background. And so page one is super important. Perfect. Totally agree. Thank you, Alistair. And then my very last question from the audience is going to be around if a member has worked in very similar positions or the same job positions, but in different companies how would they then be able to organize the content as of course they've done a pretty similar job description or achieved the same sort of results from each job yeah that's also a good one so page one would still be a summary of all the best bits of that um so there'd be a, a good introductory statement there'd be the key skills and they'd be a mass from everything that you've done then there'd be three career highlights and they'd be the best three you could possibly pull from any of your experiences anywhere and then when you get to your career history um you you maybe you wouldn't spend too much time explaining all these similar things you you'd note them you date them and you give them some structure and what i'd recommend is that you'd focus within each role that you had on some of the more minor achievements uh, and accomplishments that you'd had in each of the roles that you'd done, because you've probably done more than you imagine. You've probably forgotten some things you've done that are really good and your audience would be very interested in and make that the focus of the document with each of these roles that you think are quite similar, but I suspect you could find different things within each of the roles to talk about and that would become uh, the focus of the roles that you have on your CV. But page one, again, I can't I can't overstate how important page one is. That's the best examples that you've got from any of your jobs. They need to be appearing on page one. Lovely. 
Thank you, Alistair. And thank you to all those members that have joined us today and put forward your questions. Um, I hope you found that really insightful. I certainly found that great to have some key takeaways for yourselves who are looking at to improve their CV. So that concludes today's webinar. Now we will be sending out the recording um, and these slides as well to you over the coming week. And of course, you will be hearing from Alistair again next Friday on the 23rd of July. So if you haven't registered for that session, please do come along. And I think that's going to flow really nicely from what we've learned today. And then how can you apply um, those learnings into your LinkedIn profile? So thanks for joining and looking forward to seeing you all next Friday.